then uh, you know why exactly the kind of data which we have is unique in some sense uh, and what difficulty it causes uh, and then the kind of tricks or uh, you know the, uh, the theory which we use uh, for getting better results and then some little bit of work on some more cutting edge and uh, newer techniques like multiple kernel learning and deep learning. Uh, so essentially the idea is of machine learning is you have a set of essentially you have a set of vectors uh, x is a matrix like each of is a vector and then those vectors get mapped to a function so essentially what you want to identify is what that function f is from the multiple points which are given to you uh, from the data set uh, so if fx is discrete 1 minus 1 1 2 3 4 there is a classification problem, continuous regression problem, and so on. Uh, so, for financial stuff, uh, uh, you know, so I mean, the problem is as simple as you know, I am trying to predict how many uh, of you know what uh, Nifty is. Okay, so many of so basically, it's an index which is traded in Indian market. So, the problem could, could be as simple as I want to predict what's going to happen to Nifty index from today to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's as simple as that. So whether it is going to go up or whether it is going to go down. And you know, I mean like this problem, if it can be solved with a reasonable success, can make a lot of money obviously because if the market is going to go up tomorrow, you can buy it today and then sell it tomorrow at a higher price. If it's going to go down, then you can sell first and then buy it uh, tomorrow. So you can make money that way also. Uh, so essentially, you know, the thing which we will try to see is will a traded instrument, financial instrument like Nifty uh, will go up or down in the next period uh, with what probability that it will go up or down uh, is it possible to design algorithms which will be more accurate on larger moves obviously you know if the move is larger then you will, you have an opportunity to make more money on that so you know I mean can you design an algorithm which actually goes wrong but goes wrong on a smaller move and you know when the move is large it goes more right uh, how to select x for a given security so if i want to predict nifty uh, how do i select the attributes you know i mean what are the attributes that are important so for example you know somebody was talking in the morning about uh, like if you want to predict something about a, a user of a website then you see which website that user has previously visited and on this particular website what that user has searched and so so these are like what uh, in, in machine learning terminology we call it attributes so how to select these attributes so that it becomes easy for predicting the you know binary move whether it is going to go up or down so that becomes you know so that is where all the domain knowledge this is selecting x is where all the domain knowledge comes into picture so everything else is sort of done automatically by the machine learning algorithm yeah. So, your x is the parameters that you use, right? Yeah. So, uh, there's a lot of things that happens in uh, financial instruments happens in real time. Yeah. Like if uh, the finance minister says something, yeah. that is an x. So, yeah. So, uh, depending on what kind of problems you are uh, focusing on, that could be an uh, input. Uh, we are not using that. We are not using text mining kind of a work. So, uh, for example, you know, I mean, uh, what financial finance minister says, or you know, what company CEO says when the earnings come out. You know, there are companies in the world, not in India, I think, but like there are companies in the world who actually do text mining to analyze, you know, whether the CEO, whatever CEO is saying, whether it's a positive thing for the future stock price or negative thing for future stock price, and you know, those can also be used as attributes over there. We are not doing that right now, but you know, that can be done. Uh, 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 another thing is which method of learning we should choose. Uh, you know, I mean, like here uh, again, as I said, you know, it becomes very important because any small improvement we can get in the predictive accuracy goes a very, very long way in terms of making a uh, what we call a strategy of prediction from uh, loss making to profit making. And if it's already profit making, then it's like profit increases, and then you know. Uh, that that can be a billion millions and probably billions of uh, dollars of money. So, uh, uh, so and like you know, for a learning algorithm, how do we at least check whether it would have worked historically? So essentially, you know, I mean, like financial markets have a history of let's say five or ten years, like you know, relevant history. 
uh, what would you you would like to do is you know you would like to design an algorithm and then at least test whether it would have worked historically if we had applied it at that particular time. Uh, and you know I mean like if if it would have worked historically then there is some chance not guarantee that it will work in future also. But if it if if it didn't even work historically then there is no chance that it will sort of work in future. So uh, you know, I just wanted to show this graph in terms of you know what we are trying to predict. So essentially, you know, so if you see, these are the daily movements of Nifty. So Nifty index, and uh, you can see how volatile it is. Essentially, what we are trying to each each of this thing is actually a day, and on that day we are trying to predict whether it is going to go up or whether it is going to go down. So. It just keeps like you know, it, it looks like a random noise. So you know, I mean, and that that is what it makes it so difficult to you know predict like what's going to happen. Uh, also, the usually the financial instrument data, traded financial instrument data, is what we call a condition. What what do I mean by a condition? If you actually you know take all these returns, so return is simple. Basically, tomorrow's price or today's price. Minus yesterday's price divided by yesterday's price. That is a percentage. Uh, so if you take an average of that, it is like you know, over this whole period, it is 6.7 e raised to minus 4. But if you take a standard deviation of this data, then it is 0 0.016. So if you take a ratio of standard deviation to mean, that is 23. So because of this, what happens is there are every day the index is moving a large amount. But you know, over a period of time, because on a given day it may move positive or negative, over a period of time, actually, most of the movements cancel out, and then you know, you get only like you know, 12 or 13 percent per annum kind of a return, like over a long period of time. So, for, for example, you know, I mean, this is 1.6 percent. So, daily move of Nifty can be about 1.2 about 1.2 percent. And you can imagine there are 250 trading days in a year. So if you could capture every day's move correctly, then you would be making 1.3 multiplied by 250 percent return in one year. So nobody makes that kind of return, right? I mean that is like four, five hundred percent return only on one single instrument. And because nobody can get it accurate hundred percent, nobody can make that kind of return. And nobody can get accuracy to that level because of this. Thing. Essentially, the average. Is the signal is very very small and the noise is very very large in the uh, plutosis. If you know what that means, it's basically the fourth movement of the uh, probability distribution. Uh, that is very large. So basically, if you had a Gaussian distribution, which all of us know, this plutosis would be three, and this is twelve. So that means there are many many very large moves. Uh, also, if you have heard about six sigma events and stuff like that. Then six sigma event is basically 350 times more likely to have a six sigma event as compared to you know a Gaussian uh, distribution. So all these things and including non-stationarity. Basically, if you see, there are small moves over here, there are large moves over here. Because of that, you know the distribution from which these moves are coming from also changes over a period of time. So, any questions? So x-axis is just days. So basically, this is uh, January uh, 2003, I think. Yeah. So that is January 1st, January 2003, and this is like you know three days back when I actually created this presentation. Uh, another thing is you know I mean like one of uh, so this is what we call is a time series, right? So. Uh, one of the ways of analyzing whether there is, uh, there is a predictability in time series is what we call autocorrelation. So, if you actually do autocorrelation of these returns, then you will see that there is no autocorrelation. So, basically, what happened yesterday is of hardly any, you know, I mean, like information to decide what is going to happen today. And this is why, you know, most of the linear methods will become almost useless as far as, you know, I mean, like. Uh, Especially if you do it as a univariate analysis. So, if you just use uh, Nifty data of last five, six days and try to predict what's going to happen tomorrow, that is not going to work very well because you know there is no autocorrelation over here. So, there is no dependency on what's going to happen tomorrow over last one, two, three, four, five, six, up to whatever 20 days. Um, 
another thing is what happens is suppose you know by by whatever method I want to do, if I am able to build a prediction system which does a about 50 52 percent accuracy of prediction, then because of the transaction cost etc., that actually system either loses money or breaks money. So basically, I have 100 moves. On those, I need to be right only in 52 times and then wrong 48 times. So essentially, I have a net gain of 4 moves, right? So 4 moves multiplied by 1.1% on an average per day, which means 4.5%. So 4.5% over 100 days is approximately the transaction cost you end up giving in trading this particular instrument. And uh, that essentially is breaking even or losing slight amount of money. But suppose you could build a system which is only 56% accurate, which means only 4% more accurate than you know the break-even system, then this actually makes a phenomenal amount of profit. Why phenomenal amount of profit? 56 minus 44 is 12. 12 multiplied by 1.1 is about 13. So basically 13% return for every 100 days. So in a year there are 250 days, so basically in a year you would be able to make approximately 30% return annualized. So which is, I mean anybody would love to have an investment which actually generates 30% return year on year, right? So, uh, I, I, the reason I am showing you these two numbers is because, you know, it is, we are playing so close to randomness, essentially our com system completely uh, uh, you know, random would be 50% accurate and a system which is, you know, a slightly more predictable is 56% accurate and a system which is as close to randomness is able to make money. So it's very hard to actually differentiate multiple systems which are random from each other, which is actually a real prediction and which actually is a random system. And that's my uh, next slide. So here what I did is I took that data of Nifty and I randomly generated plus ones and minus ones for those 2000 plus points 100 times. Okay. So basically I had these 100 quote unquote systems which were random systems and I chose the one which had the best accuracy out of that. So these are like, you know, there is no intelligence over here. I am just creating a random signal of that thing and choosing the one which gives me the most accurate. So that is the blue line. So you can see, you know, I mean, it looks as if you are going to make money using that particular system. But it's a randomly generated signal. So, you know, it has made money in sample, but obviously it's not going to work if you start using it out of sample. So, that essentially is, is, is a big problem, right? Because you could do so-called machine learning and you could do all kinds of trading, technical indicators and this and that and you could maybe do it many, many times. You have a certain amount of data and you say that, okay, I mean, if somebody, any of you guys trade, then you know, you use moving average uh, or something like that and you know, you change uh, six weeks moving average, four weeks moving average, you change it around and see which one gives you the better accuracy. So you can think of this, if there was no predictability in financial markets and if you were doing this many many times, so, so let's say you generate these hundred random systems, just by this logic you are actually going to get one case which is going to give you a profitable system in sample but when you put it into the market, it's not actually going to make money for you. Uh, any questions on this? So, okay. So, uh, if this was much higher, so basically this is the first line. So, let's say if it was at 0.4, that means what's going to happen tomorrow is positively autocorrelated with what happened yesterday. So, if yesterday's return was positive, then it's going to happen that tomorrow's return is also going to be positive. If it was below, then it means it's going to be negative. So why axis is Why axis is the strength by which you know the adjacent moves are correlated with the each with each other. So we are saying about the adjacent moves. Every time you are making the same same amount of money you are investing. Sorry. Uh, you are saying hundred moves, right? Uh, 
No, no. So what I'm saying is, if you have 100 moves, the average size of each move is 1.1 percent average. So some of them are much larger, some of them are much smaller. But the average size is 1.1 percent. So on an average, if you were going wrong uniformly, uh, independent of the size of the move, then what would happen is 56 percent accuracy system would actually end up giving you what we call edge of 56 minus 44, which is 12 percent edge. So basically, for every 100 moves, we are doing 12 moves better than, you know, I mean like, basically we are, there are, there are net 12 moves which we are going to make money. Basically, 44 moves are going to be positive by random uh, chance, 44 moves are going to be negative by random chance and 12 moves essentially we are going to be able to predict correctly. And so this 12 multiplied by 1.1 becomes approximately 30 percent. So for 100 moves, which is 100 days, which is approximately half a year. In half a year, you actually are able to make 13%. So, yeah, so, so so then I can uh... Uh, yeah I mean there are different ways of investing actually uh, we, we are not <coughs> talking about investing right now but what you could do is you could invest 1 lakh rupees or 1 rupee every day and then in 100 days what you could end up doing is if you are investing 1 rupee then you would make 13 pesos so that is what so uh, the uh, classification problem only classifies uh, the direction of the movement but doesn't uh, classify the I mean, yeah. So, right. suppose you have the uh, up moves uh, which are smaller in magnitude, uh, and the down moves are relatively larger in magnitude. Yeah. Then yeah. you have different results. Uh, that is not. I mean, like, see, basically, we are not actually talking about whether the move is up or the move is down. Whether we are more accurate on what kind of moves. Because we can make money for on up moves also and we can make money on down moves also. So essentially, you know, as long as your accuracy is same for both kinds of moves, you would on an average end up making the same. Let me let me rephrase the question. The question is the most fifty percent of the cases that fifty six percent that you are accurately able to predict. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the direction. Is what you predict. Yeah, not, not the magnitude. Not the magnitude. Yeah. Because duration prediction is high enough, your <laughs> magnitude prediction becomes even more difficult. So but yeah, there can be a regression type of models where you know you are trying to predict magnitude and then do investment based on that also. So but right now we are mainly focusing on uh, direction prediction, but we try to take care of magnitude in some other way in that in our practical way. So, what does So, efficient markets, I mean, like that's mostly in academia. Nobody believes that. Uh, otherwise, this whole financial industry of trillions of dollars would not exist. So, uh, that is mostly for academic reasons, and that has been put there because, you know, I mean, it makes proving certain theorems easy. And actually, efficient markets mostly are used in a way that okay, efficient market is an equilibrium state. So that actually gives you a way of measuring of whether the current condition of the market is actually much away from the equilibrium. So you know, it actually works as actually a trade generation mechanism because you know you are not if you are not in the equilibrium state, so you will be able to actually you know measure how far you are from the equilibrium state and then take a trade on it. So it's probably a little complicated, but we can talk offline later. Uh, the absence of auto correlation does it imply that we cannot use the historical solution to prove that? Absence of auto correlation implies that we can't use linear or uh, univariate methods to try and predict uh, this particular security. Linear univariate. So basically, I mean, you know, I mean, I could have a variable which is not dependent on itself at all. But it is dependent on something else which I have access to. 
So then that is a multi red box. So I can't use you know last four days of Nifty data and expect that and I'll be able to predict. I'm sorry. I can't use this for the simulation. That's that univariate. Univariate means if if I'm looking at only behavior of Nifty, then I don't have a chance of predicting Nifty in theory by using linear methods. Non-linear methods there could be I mean because autocorrelation only works for linear uh, uh, modeling methodologies. I can use the numbers. So it's just a from normal pseudo random number generator. Uh, I'm only see basically I'm randomly generating whether it is plus one or minus one. So whether I want to go long today, whether I want to buy the security today, or whether I want to sell the security today. So the rand n or whatever normal random number generation which I am using actually has no relevance in this particular case because I am only doing the signals. I am taking the sign of the random number. In terms of the spider data, you see the number of nodes and the Yeah. That actually, so that's what I'm saying. My simulation process and my historical data are not really connected. So I mean, we can maybe talk about this offline later. Yeah. 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 So that I mean, like. That probably a little bit ahead, you will get to see what kind of stuff which we are trying to do. That doesn't mean that that's the only thing one can do. Okay, so exactly to answer your. So as I said, you know, I mean, like the autocorrelation essentially shows that you know you can't use historical data of Nifty returns to try and predict what's going to happen tomorrow. But it may be possible that you know I can predict what's going to happen to Nifty by using what's happening right now in U.S. markets, or in Asian markets right now, or in European markets right now. So one can actually use all these data together and then create that attribute matrix X, and then try and see if there is enough predictability in that. So, for example, you know, I mean, like theoretically, not theoretical, but practically speaking. If any of you are trading, then you know that what happens in U.S. market yesterday becomes very, very important to what's going to happen to Indian markets today. So, just I mean, like one thinks that that should be the case. So, you can use that particular fact in your data that you say, okay, okay I'm going to use what happened in U.S. markets yesterday as my one of my attributes to try and predict what's going to happen to Nifty from today to tomorrow. Similarly, you can do it. Let's say you know. What is happening to gold is very important to you know what's going to happen to security markets because you know usually they have opposite relationship. Whenever there is a danger that economy is going to fall into inflation or something like that, gold is going to go up and then you know equity markets are going to go down. There is an opposite relationship. So let let's use gold. What's happening to gold right now and then use uh, you know some kind of machine learning algorithm to actually understand what uh, you know how that effect actually gets uh, uh, modeled. Uh, another thing is, uh, you know, as compared to uh, you know most other problems, one difference that we have is we have a time series data. So essentially, you know, it's not like you know one instance of a user is completely independent of another instance of another user. Actually, you know, there is a time chronology which happens basically. You know, you, you ideally should not be using you know what behavior market has in 2005 to analyze what behavior market would have had in 2003 because you know trying to predict what is happening in 2003, you know you did not have access to what is happening in 2005. So you know you should not be using that. So that is what we end up doing. It's called walk forward. What we have done over here is we have arranged the data. So this is each of this line is the row of x, and this plus or minus is whether on that particular day market went up or down. So that is 2003, and this is yesterday, essentially. So what we do is historically, so back testing process. So we we take some amount of data, say like two years of worth of data, 
you know, then use that data to build some models. So let's say you know something simple like logistic regression or support vector machine or whatever you want to do. Build that model using that data. Then predict for today. So you know historically maybe you were right using your model or you were wrong. You just keep track of that. And then move your window forward by one point. Repeat the process. And then what these signs are vis-a-vis -vis what actual movements were is what characterizes your backtesting performance. So historically if we had applied this strategy then how it would have worked and whether it would have made money for us in the market or not. And if you see each of these prediction is completely out of sample. So you know so there is some hope that whatever we are doing over here actually has some hope of working in future. Uh, so this is probably want to put you to sleep. I will not talk about it too much, but you know, I mean, just to uh, just as a preamble to my next slide. Essentially, you know, I mean, like in machine learning, this bias variance trade-off actually is something very, very important. I mean, most of us actually don't pay attention to that because you know, usually from prediction perspective, most of the real world problems are fairly uh, simple. So whether you use linear models on that or you know, whether you use non-linear models on that doesn't really matter. But since we are working here very close to randomness, it becomes very important. So what happens if you use something, some very simple model, like a linear regression model, and then whatever comes out of that, you take a sign of that. So if you use that kind of a model, then what we call is that model is extremely biased. So there is no hope that whatever is the relationship among the variables which we are using to predict, that actually will be properly captured by a linear model. Because we know that the world is not linear. Now if you actually make the model extremely non-linear, then what happens is like there is a hope that the actual function which you are trying to approximate is part of this whole non-linear class of the models which we are using but what ends up happening is this set becomes very big and then it becomes very difficult to actually you know pinpoint you know which model you are trying to do. So this is a bias and this is a variance. So because you are given a certain amount of data and you are trying to identify uh, you know using that data what that model parameters are essentially you know this set which is a variance this becomes much much bigger as compared to that and the theory goes that bias plus variance is more or less difficult to manage it is difficult to come up with algorithms which reduce both bias as well as variance so what we try to do uh, some of the uh, things which we try to do to try and say uh, I mean like uh, let, let me try and emphasize you know now over here uh, the motivation is that you know if we can do something which robustly improves our prediction accuracy by even one percent or one and a half percent, that is actually a very big deal for us because you know it ends up increasing our returns by four or five percent per year, and increasing annualized returns by four or five percent per year is actually can be a very large amount of money. So what we do is you know I mean bagging. Probably you guys have heard about bagging. So what bagging is essentially, you know, you have the data set, you essentially, you know, sample sub data sets from that, use the same methodology and then whatever are the samples, you essentially do the averaging of that uh, and then use that as a prediction. Then multiple learners on those with different underlying theories. So let's say you have a support vector machine. Logistic regression has a simple, similar philosophy, but then you have random forests or trees or you have a Bayesian approach of doing so. You have, you have been given a data, you apply these various models to it, you try and predict the same uh, thing out of that. Some, because it is so close to randomness, sometimes SVM will be correct, sometimes logistic regression will be correct, sometimes your random, random forest will be created, correct. And then when you combine these, there is a hope that, you know, I mean, this combined prediction system, which is an averaging system, works actually better uh, in practice. Uh, then multiple kernel learning, I'll talk. I don't know if I'm going to get time, but I'll talk a little bit more detail about that. Then combining unsupervised and supervised learning. So essentially, you know, your data set may have some clusters. And you know, you can actually train your supervised learning model on one of the clusters. And you might actually do better on that. 
uh, boosting if you know what it is it is not very useful because financial data is very noisy data and boosting generally doesn't work with uh, noisy data sets um, in general you know whatever you find in theory generally you will see that things work a little bit worse on financial data because of the amount of noise that the data has also another interesting thing is market learns and trades against you so basically if you are running a successful algorithm for long enough time other players in the market so essentially financial markets trading for you to make money somebody has to lose the money obviously nobody likes to lose the money so they really permanently try and you know learn what you are trying to what you are doing which makes you make money like you know in the long term and then they learn that and then they trade against you so basically if they know that you are going to take a long position they may actually you know before you actually take a long position and take the price of the security up before you actually buy it um no i have not used it yet um uh, but there are people who use it so there are wavelets for your ones comments of people who use that to uh uh yeah so essentially take a line from one of the movies three things are most important averaging 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 so you know, so actually three things are like really bad also uh, optimization 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 so if you actually try and optimize your model a lot it actually works really badly for financial markets in out of sample averaging is a really nice process too uh so as i just said combining multiple methods generally you know uh, so i am being very secretive uh, not very but this is secretive over here i am not telling you these are the real results i am not telling you what assets i have applied it on and i am not telling you what methods i am using but uh, still uh, the point i am making over here is you know this is the kind of improvement we look for so like if you see this curve this is the averaging process the black one and you know i really like this because across the methods is actually outperforming the individual methods which are part of the averaging process so you know if actually this method performed very well on a6 but it performed badly on a1 generally i don't want to use it for a6 and discard it for a1 because you know i mean these are similar prediction processes and generally i want things which work across the board that is my way of taking care of the fact that i am not overfitting the data and you know something is going to give me great results in sample but not so great results in out of sample yeah i'm sorry it is not in one case but in most of the cases it is oh it is where it is not better i think over here this one is better Oh, that is why so whatever excel i mean i didn't change the numbers so <laughs> uh so now what i call quote and quote cutting edge method so this we really love right i mean basically because this is the uh, cutting edge machine learning research and our data sets are not very large it's just that you know i mean we have fairly small data sets like basically you know we may have 20 25 attributes and 2000 5000 you know sample points and from that we want to apply the best possible method which is out there which in a robust way actually guarantees us that the our predictions are made so from that perspective you know we are doing what i would say a lot of core machine learning algorithms uh, because our attention is not so much on you know i mean like how to clean the data and you know how to make sure uh you know some of the other things are uh, like taken care of uh, also another thing i should say that we don't really do any fundamental research in our company essentially by cutting edge means you know whatever is just recently published in january 2014 or something like that that we try to implement in our uh, work uh so i will rush through this because probably if you have heard about uh, support vector machines you know you probably know about this so uh essentially you know it's a basically a linear separator and then you know you orient the separator in such a way that the margin between the two sets is maximized that is the support vector machine logic and uh, generally it works very well in practice uh that was only linear if you want to actually solve some non linear problem then you use kernel trick for that 
So if you had this kind of a data set, valid data set to, to classification, generally you can actually transfer your data to some other domain and over there it is actually a linear separator. The, this talks about the more mathematical part of the kernel trick. Uh, so this kernel function which actually you know uses, so this is our original data set and then we, use, we are using some kind of a non-linear function to transform it into a non-linear space so that it becomes easier to separate the data in that space. Uh, so there, there is a lot of theory behind this. So essentially what it says is, you know, there is a theorem called Mercer's theorem which says that a, every semi-positive definite symmetric function is a kernel. So essentially, you know, if you have this matrix, if it's a positive symmetric net matrix, then it actually works as a kernel function on any data set. Now people use this fact and, you know, uh, so this is actually just the support support vector machine, uh, you know, formulation. So this is where the kernel function comes into picture. And I am going through all this because, you know, I am going to motivate multiple kernel learning out of this, which we are uh, trying to do. So historically there has, so how to decide decide what kernel matrix to use? Historically there has, there has been a lot of research and since the theory only specified that K should be positive semi-definite, people try to do something called uh, semi-definite learning, on uh, semi-definite optimization on this. To actually, you know, uh, essentially what you are doing is you are trying to maximize the, you are trying to find the nonlinear transformation mapping in such a way that the margin also gets maximized because of that non-linear non mapping in addition to the margin of the data set. So uh, as you can imagine this is a very very, this is a big flexibility that is there. So what ended up happening is uh, this problem actually overfitted. So you know people could not get good out of sample results out of that. And then, then recently there is something called Marshall theory where you know you try and uh, find a solution which is you know constant in, in some way. Uh, essentially one norm of the solution actually is equal to one and uh, then people try to take cues from that theory and then try to uh, uh, like do the selection of kernel matrix and that is where uh, you know multiple kernel learning came into picture. Uh, so uh, going back to our problem, essentially what we would want to do is, let's say we have nifty, right, we want to do the nifty prediction. Let's say we have a self-information attributes, so let's say last 4-5 days returns, volumes, super interest, whatever. Then there are supporting Indian market variable, maybe the inflation in Indian market, foreign exchange rate, USD, INR, whatever that rate is. Now supporting non-Indian market variables, so let's say US market, European market, Asian market. So these x1, x2, x3, essentially you know, I mean like you can define kernel 1, kernel 2, kernel 3 of that and then do a x1 multiplied by kernel 1 plus x2 multiplied by kernel 1 plus x3 multiplied by kernel 1 and then work under you know this uh, one norm of x which is x1, x2, x3 is equal to 1 and then you try and solve the joint optimization problem using that. So that's the multiple kernel learning, that's a fairly recent uh, work which is out there and which we try to use it again same assets uh, one kernel learning, uh, usually we end up using RBF kernel, if you know what that is. And then multiple kernel learning we try to do on that. And generally again the goal is to, you know, on everything you should do slightly better. We have not been too successful at it yet. These are like a bit lower than, you know, the one kernel learning. But some improvements are there. So we are not going to apply it into practice yet because, you know, it's not consistently working as well. So. Then if you have heard about something called deep learning, that's actually a big deal these days. Uh, I don't understand that topic very well. Uh, essentially from a layman's perspective, all I see that normal neural networks have one hidden layer, deep le uh, networks have multiple hidden layers in between. And what ends up happening is you know, essentially each of these nodes uh, starts becoming specialized for a particular type of uh, sample. So essentially, you know, Google actually did a big uh, like project like a couple of years back where they, using this deep learning, they identified uh, which images had cats in it. So, uh, so that was actually you know, something 
which we tried to do a little bit, not at all successful at it. Uh, but it's a race. Uh, if you actually learn about it, start a company, you won't have a problem getting it funded. Uh, somebody will probably in a couple of years buy you out for hundreds of million dollars also. Uh, so somebody from you should try it. And um, you know the good thing about this is that you know I mean like um, how to say what ends up happening is you know if you feed enough data to this, then each of these nodes becomes specialized for a particular type of uh, you know object. So for financial data, it could be that like if you feed enough financial data then this node will become active for a certain kinds of behavior of financial data. This node will become active for certain other kinds of behavior of financial data. And you know, because of this, I don't actually manually need to decide which attributes to use. I can throw a lot of data to this thing and you know, I mean, hope that you know, automatically it's going to understand you know, what kind of combination of different data sets actually make things uh, easier and then use that as a predictor. Okay. So the the yeah, um, yeah, so uh, people are talking about those correspondences. I mean, I'm not sure how sort of relevant uh, they are, but you know, I think Siri uses, they claim to use some deep learning uh, in recognizing the voice and stuff like that. So, uh, so this is actually something, you know, I mean, if it can be done, it would be really good because uh, this uh, has become a rage recently because it's almost uniformly breaking all the you know online competition records of you know accurate predictions of different problems. So previously those records were held by support vector machines mostly, and you know deep learning is actually going uh, a few percentage points ahead of support vector machines, and that actually is a very very big thing. How is it different from neural networks? So I don't understand about it enough. So what happens is like if you put lot of uh, layers in the neural network, it becomes extremely difficult to learn because you know uh, it works on something called gradient descent, and those gradients vanish when you actually start computing them because you have multiple layers, those start vanishing, and because of that, it becomes computationally horrendous to keep track of you know all the calculations. And then this uh, Hinton is a sort of considered as the father of this deep learning kind of a thing, so he came up with a couple of you know, new innovations which actually made that problem easier. And then that, from that point onwards, actually it started becoming a viable uh, solution for different problems. Evolution on the same kind of Yeah, so I mean, I don't know if there is like a fundamental difference between a new simple neural network and a deep uh, network, other than you know, the kind of algorithms you use to train them and make sure they don't overfit or you know, I mean, they do the training. Uh, so a little bit about you know I mean I, I already talked obviously a little bit about you know what we actually do. So uh, we have multiple strategies which are running uh, you know in the market and you know we are making money sometimes, losing money sometimes. Uh, net net we are making a little bit more than we are using because we have been in the market for the last four years. So I guess some money has been made. And this is the kind of stuff which we are able to do. So this is basically this is a real graph. Actually, this is the, the red curve is the real money made. This is the nifty behavior, and this is how our portfolio is performed. So, you know, I mean, so these are this is all real numbers. So there are no simulations and randomly generated signals and stuff like that over here. Uh, that's it basically. Uh, uh, we are a small company of like eight people, and that is what we do day in and day out. I mean, just. Try and apply machine learning to financial prediction problems. Yeah. Sorry, I did not. Commodities, right? Yeah, we do actually some of those A1 to A6 were commodities. Uh, are these to other companies as well like, I'm to the markets. Their price of the uh, yeah, if you can have uh, historical data uh, which is reliable 
and uh, if you could find indicators, so for example, you know, I mean, if you could find indicators of like, you know, how, I mean, we know how bad the rainfall prediction is in India. So, but if you had a reasonable rainfall prediction, then actually it would be very nice to use that to actually do prediction of these. Now, these predictions, how you would use is a different story because, you know, uh, vegetables etc. are perishable. So, you couldn't actually, you know, buy it and hold it for next three months. Other than the fact that you know now government is also making the holding you know non level offense, but uh, that, that, that's another story. So how you could use these predictions is a different story. But the theory doesn't actually you know I mean like you could apply it if you I mean if you know that field well enough. And is everything directly to information in this? No, uh, I mean depends on. Uh, so normally I would say you know I mean now in Nifty we are using about twenty different. Uh, variables to try and predict what's going to happen to Nifty today. So you know, so that will have some Indian market variables, some you know, I mean like inflation like variables, some you know, gold prices, you know, maybe copper prices, maybe some global market, you know, so whatever you can think of which actually, you know, I mean like, so that process right now is manual. So that is where domain knowledge comes into picture, where you know, actually I sit there and think, you know, I mean like, what kind of variables would be relevant for predicting Nifty and you know then try out a few or there also I can't try I mean I can't say that okay these are like 2000 variables I will use 20 at a time and then you know I will put it through a simulation because that will become exactly same as you know doing 100 random simulations and choosing the one which is actually the best out of that. So uh, that is why I said you know optimization in this field actually is the worst possible thing you can do. You can't really do this where you know you are running 100 simulations and choosing the one which actually gives the best results and say that okay this is the one which what I am going to implement. So, how long do you think uh, it will take for uh, like you said that an algorithm in a stock market situation as is like because there will be someone else who start trading against that algorithm. Yeah. So how long do you think you like we just saw that the success was how long do you so what's the strategy for uh, So uh, in theory machine learning should take care of that, right? Because you know machine learning is what learns from the market behavior. So essentially somebody else is trading against you, but you are learning the fact that somebody is trading against you. So you can incorporate that information in your machine learning and then you know your algorithm improves. So, for example, you know, I mean, let me give you a concrete example. So, let's say your signal is saying that you buy something today, and somebody has already identified that you have a system actually which tends to say buy on such days. So, he comes to market one hour before and buys a lot of that quantity. So, by the time you buy it, the price has already moved up. But then your algorithm, if that happens enough times, will understand that okay, somebody is actually doing that to you. So, you know, so now from here you should actually go short. So you should sell that security because the up price which has moved up, taken up by this particular guy or multiple guys, from there actually by tomorrow actually the price goes down. So eventually you know I mean that can happen. So this process will keep on going until you know the market comes to a complete equilibrium where there is no underprice or overprice security. But that's I mean doesn't happen because you know there are so many different players with so many different philosophies and so many different horizons of you know. Are there any human beings trading in the market? Yeah, I mean I think still majority of them are human beings. So that is where uh, one tends to make money. So I mean it's not possible to make money and trading against the machines. So. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it's very hard to actually do a uh, you know genuine algo which actually will do better than insider trading, obviously. But generally, you know what we have observed is. When we tried to apply these kind of algorithms to individual stocks, it was very difficult for us to make money. Because what happens is there are pockets of investors who actually know the CEO of that particular company and they know 
they get the information. So they move the stock. So it's very hard for a person to make money on that. But whenever we do like this widespread uh, security, like Nifty or something like that, there it works. Because you know, there, there are generally people are not big enough to actually know the inside information of the you know, whole economy or something. That makes sense. हाँ, so this is actually you know what up to now for us it has been mainly based on human intelligence deciding which attributes to use. But that also process can be to an extent you know I mean like one can use statistical correlations and mathematical correlations for that. Instead of auto correlation or you know I mean cross correlations one could use something like mutual information which is more robust to nonlinear effects. Uh, PCA is something where you know you have a lot of variables and only some variables of those you think are important. So you know, so you do PCA and then you know it's a 20 dimensional system, it's a 20 dimensional PCA and then you see that only 10 of them actually explain the most of the variance and the last 10 actually don't make any difference at all. So and then you uh, reject those. Uh, generally what we have seen is PCA doesn't work too well because the low information is what actually ends up making the system predictable. So generally we have seen in our work at least that the PCI has not worked too well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.